If you were to ask someone to name some of the most influential figures in video games, there's a lot of names that they could choose. John Carmack, Gabe Newell, Shigeru Miyamoto, Hideo Kojima, and many others. And it's not just because, of course, of the hand in the actual video games that they've worked on. For example, Shigeru Miyamoto has helped define a genre with uh, platformers, with Mario, but also the contributions to the industry at large. For example, yes, Gabe Newell has worked on titles like Half-Life, but Gabe Newell has also created Steam. And I don't really feel I need to say much more than Steam if you're a PC gamer. And Shigeru Miyamoto, sure, again, he's created Mario, but he also helped to define the controller for the N64, and so on and so on. But another name that you could easily throw into the hat here would be Mark Cerny. Yes, he has been the lead architect in the PS4, the PS4 Pro, the PS5, presumably the PS5 Pro, and also the PS6. And side note, the interview that we're about to go through here, he does actually give some very interesting insight into the development of the PS5, and perhaps some really good hints to what we can expect from the PS6. We'll talk about that, of course, in a moment. But also, he has been an accomplished games developer in his own right. Again, his career has lasted around 40 years, so he even has crafted some of the titles that I grew up with, for example, Sonic 2. Arguably, the best entry in the Sonic franchise, at least in my personal opinion, with Sonic & Knuckles probably coming second. Let me know if you feel differently in the comments down below. But anyway, as I said, Mark Cerny has recently been interviewed by the website GameIndustry.biz, and he was asked a ton of questions and gave some very interesting insight into what developers have been doing with ray tracing, frame rate targets in games, console development at large, and just a bunch of other stuff. Again, there is some very interesting stuff simply because it does give us some great hints as to what Sony may incorporate into the PlayStation 6, as well as just some fascinating insights into how console development is done. We're going to get into all of this, plus more, after this quick message from the sponsor of the video. If you're running a copy of Windows 10, which isn't activated, of course, not only do you have to worry about the missing customization options, but there's also that annoying Windows desktop watermark reminding you to activate. Today's video is sponsored by whokeys.com, and they have an excellent price on Windows 10 Professional, as well as Home Keys. Yeah, and they also, of course, sell games. I've bought a few Windows 10 keys with my own personal account to test everything was legit and worked in preparation for this sponsored video. You can pick up one of their keys for 25% off using the coupon code RGT in the checkout. There's links to their website in the video description. Also, if you're building a few systems, there's bundles available too. Again, you can check out whokeys.com and use the coupon code RGT for 25% off the listed Windows 10 key prices. I won't read out the entirety of the interview because it would take, let's just say, quite a while. But there are some very interesting answers Cerny has given regarding ray tracing, console development, and what gamers can expect from frame rates. There's perhaps a few tidbits of what we can expect from the PS6 here as well if we read between the lines, which we're definitely going to be doing that. I'll leave a link to the full article in the description of this video, so definitely check that out. Now, there is no shortage, of course, of PS5 Pro rumors, many of which I've leaked or spoken about before. And with the PS5 life cycle around halfway over at this point, yes, the time has gone pretty fast, I think that we're really starting to hear a lot of murmurs of what we can expect from Sony's next generation PlayStation. I think it's going to be very interesting what we can kind of learn from this interview. So again, Sony's answers are pretty comprehensive. I'll plonk the entire quote on screen, but I'm only going to read out key parts just to keep the video at least somewhat reasonable in length. I've been very surprised by the degree developers have been using ray tracing, says Sony. Putting that in, it was a big decision, and actually quite a late one. But in this case, my guess into how things have gone was just totally wrong, and I'm really happy to see the early adoption of the technology. Again, this of course is in reference to ray tracing. The other thing that's been really surprising is the push for 60 frames a second. Based on previous console life cycles, I would have expected that there'd be a lot more games that are 30 frames per second only, just because of the artwork can be so much more detailed if you have a longer time to render it. And I think this part is pretty uh, critical. It's great from a play perspective. Gamers overwhelmingly prefer games that are higher frame rates. 
I just didn't expect such a big departure from the previous generation. Now, moving out of the quote and giving my two cents on this, if you think about it, the PS5 uses RDNA 2's ray tracing hardware for its underlying architecture much the same as the Radeon RX 6000 series for the desktop. And of course, the Xbox uses a variant of it too. Ultimately, Cerny seems to be implying that the team hadn't been certain ray tracing would be embraced as much as it has been by developers, including Sony's own teams. Perhaps even the fact that ray tracing hadn't been initially considered for the PS5. Remember, the PS5 development did start before the Xbox. Titles such as Spider-Man 2, though, really have shown what the teams are capable of. And frankly, I suspect that the feedback and obvious results from developers will definitely help craft ongoing hardware. In theory, at least, ray tracing just works. Lighting and shadows act as they should. The sun, flashlights, headlights of cars create, well, light. And just like in the real world, that light bounces from different objects. Depending on the materials, of course, the number of bounces may change and it imparts color to other objects, again, depending on a number of factors. Obviously, if an object obscures a light source, let's just hypothetically say that you're standing in a dark room, and there's a door open, which leads to a very well-lit room. The door and other things, though, help create harsh shadows because they are obscuring the light sources from that room. Now, the PS5 doesn't have enough horsepower to run all games with full ray tracing with both lighting and shadows, but many games do employ it, and not only is it realistic, it means that artists can actually just have less work to do, meaning smaller teams and just less development resources. Everything is dynamic and calculated in real time, allowing assets to just be more easily thrown together. Now, this I am vastly simplifying, it's a very big topic, and it's not really just as easy as just saying press a button and game engine goes brrr. Reflections, though, are very cool too, because the glass in windows, water and other materials reflecting in the characters and other details in the scene. Basically, the key goal here is to improve the immersion, but while there is certainly work to make sure that everything works and is performant. Artists don't need to worry so much about setting up lots of static lights and other stuff, for example, cr carefully crafting light probes. Technologies such as RTGI and SSGI, Ray Traced Global Illumination or Screen Spaced Global Illumination, have really helped cut much of this out, and we've also seen technologies such as Lumen, of course, on Unreal Engine 5. The rumours swirling around the PS5 Pro indicates that the console's capabilities for ray tracing are significantly more beefed up versus the um, current machine, sporting technologies circa RDNA 3 or perhaps even better, with a 2 to 4 times increase over the base console and a plethora of options for upscaling too. Basically speaking, the machine should just be significantly more capable, and it will be very interesting to see what happens with games, particularly those which receive patches. The console also has more memory available for ray tracing and upscaling, PSSR, at least, again, according to the rumours. From what I've heard regarding the PS6, Sony will stick with AMD, but be doubling down on ray tracing. RDNA 6 or RDNA 7 were IPs I've heard associated with the machine, but frankly it's so early that this could be misinformation, and even if it is correct, due to customizations in the hardware, something Cerny goes into deeper in a moment, it doesn't really have the same ramifications compared to let's say a desktop part. Sony have also been showing off upscaling solutions for ray tracing as well. Though these are clearly focused on movies, but there was also associations with the PlayStation. Clearly, with the PSSR technologies, which will use machine learning from the beefed up capabilities of the PS5 Pro's GPU, this will be a step forward for general upscaling from the team. And from the alleged documentation provided to developers regarding the PS5 Pro, Sony are going to continue to enhance this stuff for future iterations of the hardware, i.e. the PS6. Honestly, this is going to be really interesting going forward, and I'm very excited. Now, let's get back to the frame rate discussions, because I think we can all agree, generally speaking, faster frame rates are definitely better. And ultimately, Cerny is right. Now, it does mean, however, that Cerny is right in another aspect, in that higher frame rates reduce the time for the system to do stuff. Naturally, technologies such as upscaling can be used to reduce the load on the GPU. 
But it's all about time. You get 33.3 milliseconds on average for a 30 FPS experience. And if you're going 60 FPS, well, you quite literally have half of this. Ultimately speaking, games are a series of still images being generated by whatever console or PC hardware you're playing. Those images, of course, are spat out on screen, and then you can basically interact with them using a controller, a mouse, a keyboard, what have you. While there's much more complexity to what I'm making out to be here, for example, things like the latency of the screen itself, frame generation technologies, to name just a few, the lower the frame rate is, the more latency you can expect in the controls. Games such as many of those from Sony's first-party studios have certainly employed 60 FPS, but we've also seen 40 FPS courtesy of VRR to give us some kind of middle ground. Speaking purely for myself here, and please let me know how you guys like to experience your games, I think 30 FPS is fine for turn-based RPGs, slower-paced exploration games, but higher FPS is better if you're playing action games, for example. Any degree of the precision, I really start to notice it in the controls, and it just kind of feels, well, for lack of a better word, clunky. Primarily, as you probably know if you're a regular viewer, I am a PC gamer. And for games like Alan Wake 2, Cyberpunk, and many other games, 60 FPS is absolutely okay for me. Now, sure, I will use something like DLSS on my RTX 1490, because that does allow me to push even higher frame rates, even with things like path tracing enabled. But, honestly, yeah, 60 FPS is fine for something like Alan Wake. But FPS games like, say, Doom Eternal, I want 120 hertz ideally. That's actually okay for me. I don't do multiplayer gaming, so I'm not going to throw my opinions into the mix because I don't think it's really uh, apt for me to do so because, again, I'm not playing competitive multiplayer. But I do think this is a great sign for, that Cerny will perhaps adjust the way the PS6 is designed. It's going to be very interesting to see exactly how the uh, principles around the PlayStation 6 versus the PS5 and PS5 Pro evolve. Now, obviously, we can see frame generation. And as I said, frame generation is very cool, but it also has input latencies associated with it, at least in its current iteration. Who knows what's going to happen in several years from now. It's also going to be interesting to see if Sony and other companies double down on additional helper chips or whether they're just going to just say, well, you know what, we're going to put more CPU and GPU power in it. Ultimately, it is down to the developers to leverage the performance in whichever way they choose to. But let's get back to Cerny, shall we? One of the exciting aspects of console hardware design is that we have the freedom with regards to what we put in the console. Or, to put things differently, we're not trying to build a low-cost PC. We're not bound by any particular standards. So if we have a brainstorm, the audio can become more immersive um, and dimensional, then there's dedicated units that are capable of complex math, then we can do that. Or, if the future feels like high-speed SSDs rather than HDDs, we can put an end-to-end -end system in the console, everything from the flash drives to the software interfaces that the game creators use, and get a 100% adoption. I like to think that occasionally, we're even showing the way to the larger industry, and that our efforts help benefit PC gaming as well. It's a tech-heavy example, but the PS4, we had a very efficient GPU interface and some of that may have spurred on DirectX to become more efficient in response. Or to look something more consumer-focused, I believe that releasing the PS5 in 2020 has very high-performant integrated SSD put pressure on the PC world to get their corresponding direct storage API into the hands of gamers. There's a recent development here, which is console-exclusive that are created to run on bespoke PlayStation systems now making their way to the PC. That conversion has been simpler than many thought. The main consequence, though, is the minimum specification for the PC version of those games gets a bit higher. Perhaps more CPUs or RAM in order to replace the missing systems. Now, that was a pretty lengthy quote, but I didn't want to cut it down because, again, I think there was a lot of interesting stuff there. Now, if we were to look at the last couple of console generations from Sony, as well as Microsoft, actually, you'll see that there are many similarities between the two vendors as well as PC hardware. The PS5 base console, roughly speaking, has a GPU which is close to the RX 6700 in specifications. 
There are some differences, and consoles do allow a greater flexibility for optimization in the hardware and the software stack. The CPU inside the PS5 is roughly speaking Zen 2 in nature, but it appears that some of the floating point stuff on the CPU was shaved down in an effort to reduce die size and encourage those type of instructions to be shunted to the GPU in the form of compute. The problem with PCs is that everyone has different hardware in terms of their capabilities. And even if you do have two comparable systems, let's say you have a 13900K and your friend has a 7950X3D. And let's say that one of you is sporting a 7900 XTX and the other one of you is sporting an RTX 4080. Now sure, there may be some frame rate differences here or there, but ultimately speaking, they're pretty close to one another. The main challenge is though, if you want to actually optimize you still need to really kind of have a lot more work ahead of you because there are so many different configurations and so many variants versus that of a console. This is where APIs such as DirectX and the fact that they are more generalized come in. With a console, you can optimize extensively to the very metal of the hardware, squeezing every last drop from the capabilities. All the PS5s in the world are outfitted with the same speed SSD, for example, same speed GPU. Another big element to this is that the PS5, as Cerny points out, has stuff on the APU which is designed, for example, to deal with decompression of data. This helps offload a lot of the work we would have otherwise seen in either the CPU or GPU for decompression. With that said, PC APIs have come a long, long way. And while DirectX 12's various improvements have helped, Vulkan arguably is as impressive seeing that it can run. With that said, PC APIs have definitely come a very long way. DirectX 12's various improvements have really helped, but Vulkan is arguably as impressive. Sure, there are some differences in the API, but seeing what this API can do and run Doom Eternal with ray tracing on a potato is just really a testament to the fact. Further, Vulkan isn't limited to a Microsoft operating system but you can run Linux and other OSs too, which is great. Now, keeping on the subject of decompression just for a moment longer, Cerny does point out direct storage for the PC. This is an API separate from DirectX. Now, this is vastly simplified yet again, but think of DirectX as the API which facilitates communication between the game and the graphics chip. Meanwhile, direct storage is what facilitates the communication between the SSD and the actual, um, well, software. So in other words, they have kind of bespoke uses. The Xbox Series consoles do leverage their own variant of direct storage as well. And much like the PlayStation 5, they have a chip on board which helps offload this work. On the PC, Microsoft's direct storage API allows either the CPU or GPU to handle decompression. And both of these have their own positives and negatives. Going into the full ins and outs of how direct storage work would just eat up a lot of video time. And I've also covered the topic before and there are a lot of great articles, including from Microsoft's own blog posts. But in a nutshell, compressed data will be sent to the GPU from the SSD and then it decompresses it as required. The largest amounts of data in a game which requires decompression, and again, this is a very generalized statement, is stuff typically destined for the GPU anyway. But moving from storage to APIs is a general concept. Console APIs really do help developers squeeze the most out of the hardware. On the PS4, for example, there were two APIs, GNM and GNMX, with the latter being a higher level API, which largely took the resource management out of the developer's hands. And it was great for developers who needed less horsepower uh, to show their games off, but also fewer resources. Let's say you're crafting a nice 2D pixel art game, for example. Now, with this, you can just kind of get stuck in and not have to worry too much about the nitty and gritty of things. But let's say you're Sucker Punch and you need to turn and tweak the dials to get the very most performance possible. Then, yeah, you're probably going to want to use the lower API. These lower level APIs from what we saw with Sony's console efforts really did show how bad the PC APIs were at the time. 
Remember, the PS4 was based on AMD's Jaguar architecture, which wasn't exactly the most performant of CPUs, and yet CPUs from the PC just were not really getting leverage properly. Many of the CPU cores were just pretty much sitting idle, and it, well, let's just say it was a bad time. And really, while Sony's APIs did show just how bad um, the PC was at this point, that doesn't actually fix any of the problems, so credit here should go to AMD for kickstarting it for the PC. It's worth noting that AMD's Mantle API was a low-level API designed for their hardware, Radeon GPUs. Now, adoption in games wasn't massive, because for one, the project didn't last too long, and for two, again, it was only for AMD GPUs. But with that said, titles which did support it, such as Battlefield and Thief, really were just much better. It was very impressive actually how much of improvement in frame rate as well as minimum frame times uh, Mantle made, especially if you had like a quad core CPU, which at the time was pretty much the higher end for, you know, the customer side of things. Now, not only was the API lower level and reduced the overhead on the GPU, but again, it allowed the usage of multiple CPU cores. Now, DirectX 11, did actually have some improvements made to allow multi-threading, but it was woeful, especially compared to Mantle. Much of the Mantle code, um, as I said, the Mantle project from AMD was discontinued, but much of the code and a lot of the philosophies behind it actually went to Vulkan uh, from the Kronos group. I actually was speaking to Neil Trevitt, who is one of the uh, head honchos over at the Kronos Group. He's actually the chair. Uh, I did an interview with him a while back where he spoke about this quite at length. And it's very hard to deny that DirectX 12 got a lot of inspiration for its design with Mantle as well. Now, of course, let's say Vulcan did make a lot of changes, including the fact that it was no longer just for AMD. Obviously, it would work for Intel and NVIDIA GPUs. Now, I also want to point out that and this is very much ancient history, that Mantle technically isn't actually the first low-level API on the PC. I want to point this out because otherwise I know I'm going to get at least one comment about this. Um, and I certainly am not mentioning this at all because I have, like, you know, rose-tinted glasses and memories of this. Um, definitely not. But the most famous 3D cards back in the day... Um, was 3DFX's Voodoo GP, uh, well, they weren't even GPUs, they were just video cards, and they leveraged the Glide API. Again, this was designed specifically for 3DFX's Voodoo lineup, and cards such as Voodoo 2 and Voodoo 3 really did shine quite a lot because of Glide's early adoption. Unfortunately for 3DFX, the API started to fall out of favor because, again, it would only work on one vendor's uh, cards. So companies such as ATI and NVIDIA, who were offering pretty decent cards in their own right, they obviously just wouldn't work with, um, with Glide. So we started to see the proliferation and the rise of DirectX and OpenGL. Now, frankly, I think the discussion around uh, PC versus console hardware it's very tricky. Fast SSDs on the PC were around long before the PS5 and Xbox Series consoles. Um, obviously, the PS4 used 5400 RPM drives, which, well, weren't ideal. You could upgrade them, however, to um, a SATA SSD, but that didn't really matter because PC games just weren't really using the drives properly. So, PC gamers did technically benefit, loading times were a little better, but it wasn't really as performant as it could have been. Ray tracing was available to PC owners as well before consoles. We first saw it with RTX 20 debuting ray tracing, um, and games like Control, Shadow of the Tomb Raider looked very impressive. Now, at this point, DirectX didn't have DXR or DirectX ray tracing support. Uh, instead, Basically, NVIDIA provided their own API, which, if memory serves, was a backbone built on Vulkan. So, yes, in this specific instance, the ray tracing technologies for the PC really gave developers insight into what you could kind of do with the console. So, in this respect, I think it's a very... I think it's a sim, you know. I think it's a very um, symbiotic relationship. I don't think that this is like combative. I think it's definitely, you know, one one benefits the other, 
and that's obviously a really good thing and games on pc like cyberpunk do look absolutely crazy maxed out and you can certainly run uh, the game and it looks absolutely beautiful on RTX 4070 and it is quite affordable. But again, it's still much more expensive than, let's say, a PS5. And I think that if you look at it from a value perspective, a PS5 and Xbox, they really are great value for the money. Rounding off uh, what I want to cover in this interview, Cerny does say that he doesn't think that consoles are going to be going anywhere anytime soon. Basically, as long as they continue to put out compelling products, people will basically buy those products. Now, of course, cloud gaming is becoming more popular, and I think that there is a really good argument for cloud gaming. It's quite difficult, of course, to carry a PS5 with you at all times, especially if you're going on a business trip or what have you. It just sometimes isn't practical, especially if you don't have a particularly good TV in the room or what have you. Yeah, it's not always the best to throw a PlayStation 5 into a plane, for example. However, with that said, I personally don't want us to be moving away from dedicated hardware anytime soon. And Cerny again does state that he thinks that as long as there is a good market for it and as long as they continue to put out good products, this is not going to be the case anytime in the near future. Personally, um, as I said previously, the PS6 I've been hearing is a traditional console. And it seems that Sony is basically affirming this with these statements. I even think that there's a good chance that the PS7 could even be a traditional console as well, but at this point, of course, what the PS7 even is, Sony haven't been working on that, of course. They are finishing off the final touches for their PS5 Pro. I don't mean in hardware at this point. It's all, of course, software development and working with developers, but the PS6, of course, is now starting to really have all of its uh, development cylinders fired up. Now, one final tidbit I did want to mention regarding the PlayStation 6 is that, yes, it's going to continue to focus on ray tracing and all of the other things that you've come to expect from this generation of console. Let's just be honest, we're not going to be moving back to traditional spinning discs anytime soon. But in terms of the next advancements we can expect, there have been a number of patents from Sony for things like AI helpers to basically if you're struggling in a game then well it can essentially help you learn and get better i.e it's going to watch what you're doing and let's say for example you're just not rolling correctly in something like demon souls or whatever it could say okay well what you need to do is like slow down your roll by like half a second okay that's better now this is an example of what these patents are doing and there are a lot of them and i'm sure there's a plethora of them that haven't been published but that plus actually having npcs be much more realistic so basically being able to take feedback from your actions and just be able to behave more naturally something that i have heard that sony are working on and we've also seen this from the industry at large for example from nvidia but outside of that physics Cloud, uh, simulation, cloth simulation, things like fluid simulations, basically everything to just make the game more interactive and realistic is something that I'm hearing that Sony are working on for the PlayStation 6. Now again, what form this actually ends up being in, it's too difficult to say right now. And there are a lot of different directions that Sony, as well as Microsoft for that matter, could go in. Um, for example, they could just put a ton of GPU performance to the fray. Now, there are still a ton of different directions that Sony could go in for the um, machine learning slash simulation aspects of the console, as well as just the design as a whole. It's going to be very interesting to see what they do. They could drastically increase the amount of CPU performance as well as GPU performance. They could perhaps put in an NPU and some other dedicated accelerator chip. And that's certainly a very interesting solution because if you were to look at what Sony have done with, let's say, the decompression block on the console, yes, technically speaking, they could have put in just extra GPU performance or CPU performance to have actually offloaded that. But I think it was Microsoft, I think it was Microsoft that said that if they were to have done that, they would have needed to add like an extra two or four, I can't remember exactly, a Zen 2 cores. I think that was an interview with Eurogamer, just to be able to essentially offset the decompression blocks. It's just not a good trade-off. Like the decompression block, it's such a small amount of silicon versus the CPU cores. So it was just a much better solution for Microsoft and Sony to, of course, done that with their respective systems. So you can make a really good argument that if you 
have something that you feel is really important as let's say sony and you can put a very small amount of die size to use to have something that's essentially bespoke towards a specific application. And again, Sony has mentioned, um, well, should I say Mark Cerny has mentioned this in this interview, then it's possibly the better way to go. I'm going to be very interested to see what happens with the next generation of hardware, of course. It's going to be absolutely fascinating because we've really got some good insights into it thanks to the PS5 Pro leaks. Obviously, with the upscaling technology that we're already seeing, I think that's a really good first step. I think that there's a very good chance that we're going to see higher frame rates being continued to be pushed by uh, Sony in the next generation, because that just seems to be the direction that they're heading in. It's also going to be very interesting to see how game development changes as well with things like AI tools, because ultimately, as I'm sure many of you are aware at this point, when it comes to games development... Sure, if you're making like, you know, a, a smaller title, it's not so bad in terms of cost and things like Unreal Engine have made it a lot easier for pretty much anyone to get into games development, especially if you've got a pretty good innovative idea that is just going to be popular. On the other hand, if you're a really big studio, well, let's just say there's a reason that games now are costing 200, 300, 400 million dollars to make. And obviously speaking, if something doesn't change and... <laughs> levels of fidelity keep going up as well as our expectation for game sizes to continue to balloon well what's going to happen with the ps6 or ps7 like are we going to get to the point where the game has to sell like you know 30 million copies to break even plus dlc but obviously that is just not sustainable with that said guys take care of yourselves have an amazing day bye for now